I'm Daniel Hentz from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It seems that every day new environmental obstacles are facing the commercial fisheries here in New England. One of those obstacles occurred last month when warm water from the Gulf Stream seeped into fishing and lobstering grounds around Block Island. The fishing almost immediately cut off for certain species along the bottom. That's Glenn Gowerkowitz, a physical oceanographer and senior scientist at Hui. And essentially what happens is the Gulf Stream becomes unstable. It makes very large meanders and eventually these meanders break off and form an eddy. That intrusion of warm water that he's talking about is also known as a warm core ring, something that Glenn says most fishing fleets couldn't predict or prepare for without adequate data and the know-how to interpret it. They can be 60 miles across and they can persist for months. And what's so tricky about these intrusions is that they can actually move across the continental shelf at mid-depth uh, and they may be anywhere from say 20 to 60 feet thick in the middle of the water column. But Glenn has been working to bridge this gap in understanding of oceanographic processes. Since 2014, he's been working directly with fishermen through the Shelf Fleet Program, a joint effort between Huey and the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation based in Rhode Island. Together, the two have been engaged in a long-term data collection effort to track the changes occurring over the continental shelf waters. So both of these research fleets involve commercial fishermen that go out on their normal day-to-day -day operations of fishing. That's Aubrey Ellertson, a research biologist and the Foundation's program liaison. And we give them equipment and the tools to collect real-time data, whether it's biological data on lobster and crab, or oceanographic, where they're getting temperature, salinity, depth information. Normally, Ellertson hears about these warm core rings from Glenn, but when one appeared offshore last month, she was pleasantly surprised that the fishermen beat him to the punch. I had received a call from Peter Spong. He's one of our members. He was noticing 58 degrees um, water on the bottom, and it seemed to shut off his Jonah crab catch uh, immediately. Sea surface temperature, we, can, we know, can change pretty rapidly, but at the bottom, the temperature can really move much more slowly. So to get a temperature change that big on the bottom, you know, it, it's pretty major. And Peter wasn't the only one who noticed. Closer to shore, Gil Netter and captain of the finest kind too, Rob Waltz, began to see the ominous signs of gulf water. There was a massive amount of dolphins around on the surface. There was so little bait around, and they were in the area. They were eating the fish out of our nets. They're so desperate that they're eating the fish as you're hauling the net. Were it not for exposure to Hui's shelf fleet program, environmental sensors, and experts like Glenn, Walt says it wouldn't have been as easy to interpret what was going on. Where'd the fish go? Where are they? Well, it's pretty much explained right there. They're not there for a reason. It all has to do with you know, the warm bottom temperatures, the salinity, the fish know that they can't spawn in that area. Though Waltz joined the program only a few months ago, he says he's already benefiting from greater access to data and high-tech sensors. And like others, he's excited to combine his traditional fishing knowledge with scientific perspective from Gorkowitz and the Foundation. Instead of wasting my time, I actually, you know, have been doing some work to the boat, which I would rather be fishing. It's actually uh, showed me a benefit to know what's going on. I almost have the boat back together, and I can't wait to go out there and get more readings. Other fishermen have learned to use their temperature and salinity readings to adjust course and look for fish that are likely to withstand the warm Gulf Stream water, even in the winter. In the case of this warm core ring, captains like Peter Sponge, who Opry mentioned earlier, relocated their traps to catch species like lobster that they knew would actually thrive in the slightly warmer water. Ultimately, they're saving money, but they're also feeling like they're a part of the conservation conversation. Yeah, I think it's built a lot of trust and transparency. You know, we give fishermen, you know, access to the data always, so they have ownership of the data. And I think the, these types of projects allow fishermen to connect to scientists that they maybe wouldn't have met otherwise. So by meeting Glenn, they have the ability now to ask questions, to try to come to some type of conclusion as to why this phenomenon is happening. Gorkwood says this bodes well for adaptation in New England's fisheries, at a time when warming seas will likely mean more frequent warm core rings, something he says is already evident in historical data. In the past 20 years, the average number of rings per year has gone from 18 to 33 rings per year. So it's nearly doubled. 
For scientists and leadership at CFRF, last month was a milestone in the ongoing dialogue between science and commercial fishing, a relationship that for a long time has been pretty fractured. And while last month's deepwater intrusion has now dissipated, Gorkowitz's excitement hasn't. I think that this is a good example of how if people are willing to listen and really to, to learn to value the issues that are going on for another group, uh, really re remarkable things can occur. To learn more about the Hui Shell Fleet project, you can go to go.hui, that's W-H-O-I, dot E-D-U slash Shell Fleet. For the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, I'm Daniel Hens.